Okay. <laughs> ready? Okay, are we ready to go? Well, are you ready? ready to go for about <laughs> We've been nine ready minutes? For a while. <laughs> we have been ready. <laughs> okay. Follow me in order. Flag is in the room. And we'll go with the, uh, the four way test of the things that we think, say, or do. First, is it the, the truth? truth? Second, is, is it fair, fair to all concerned? concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Okay. Now we have, uh, I'm showing. Nine people? No, that's 12. Yeah, 12 on my team. 14. 14 if we include the people that, in your, that are on your camera and the ones that are in Jonathan's camera. All oh, right. People. Okay. <laughs> Lori. So, okay, so we only have, uh, Lane is our, uh, is our only visiting Rotarian today. Yeah. Well, okay. we, have, we have the superintendent of the school district here to help you learn math. <laughs> or technology. Thank you very much. Technology is more important right now. Yeah. I think we need adult education. I, I can take my hat off. I'm, I'm leaving the beach. Yeah, okay. okay uh, for a, uh, a rotary moment, I would like to thank Fred. Fred called me yesterday to uh, just say, how are you doing? How are things going? Are you doing okay? Just wanted to call and check on a fellow Rotarian, and I, I appreciate that, and I thought that's a very kind gesture, and he suggested that uh, we could all do that to each other, and uh, call a Rotarian, even call a friend, call a family member, and just uh, check in with them, and make sure things are good with them, if there's anything they need, any help that uh, you might be able to give them, and uh, Fred, I thank you for that. That was a very generous uh, and kind call. Uh, announcements. Uh, let's see. First, I want to thank Gary for this wonderful experience on Zoom that some of us can master better than others. Oh, please don't thank me. <laughs> <laughs> you got us started. No, I mean, seriously, don't thank me. <laughs> don't thank you. Okay. I, I thank you. You and Helen have been very entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. How many, Lori, you went and did face masks? Face who else did we have yeah. there? <clears throat> just who else? Who else do we have there? Just you? Oh, did we uh, on this on the Sunday that I went? Not anybody from uh, that I could recognize with our face masks on from from our from our club. <laughs> okay, because the, the face mask uh, allocation is going to be coming out, and based on our donation, we'll have the opportunity if we want to to designate which medical facility in Tustin would get up to 500 face masks. So they haven't, get, they haven't told us when our allotment is ready for delivery, but if we have any, if anybody has a knowledge of a medical institution in town here who can use the face mask, otherwise uh, Dan and his group will find an appropriate location for them. But if we have some place in Tustin, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to deliver up to 500 of those face masks. Do so, we have any senior care facilities that that uh, that might qualify as that? Well, I think they're looking for more more for medical facilities, okay. Uh, okay. hospitals, treatment centers, uh, for okay. nurses, treatment centers. Uh, they'd like to get those first. Yeah. Should we ask the chamber? What? Yeah. What medical facilities? Do we yeah, have? Fred. Um, um, Knowing the client that works here in Tustin at a medical facility, I can ask him which one he works at. Well, yeah, any, anybody who's seen, seen uh, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, victims, yeah. if they're seeing them and they need that kind of uh, yeah. additional protection, that's fine. These aren't for go to the market masks. These are really for the medical providers who are treating the, the virus patients. So if we have any treatment facilities in Tustin, I'm not aware of any. I, I know well, there's, got... the, there's the one that's just on uh, on Tustin Avenue, but that's technically Santa Ana. So, but uh, um, they know the Global Medical Center, whatever it's called now. Well, there's the hospital, and, um, hospital. 
in uh, on Newport Avenue that yeah. we had this right. date from. Oh, on uh, Newport uh, Avenue. Mad or Foot Hill Mad or something. <laughs> is that a hospital or is that just a, an urgent care? Oh. I think it's a hospital. It's a hospital. It's a hospital. Okay. And that's on Tustin Avenue? No. Newport, Newport, Newport Avenue. Newport. Is that the one you were talking about, Roger? Um, I don't know if he works there. Um, I'm, I just text him to see if he could tell me the facility name. And then I can okay. let you know. Okay, you well. Know that, uh, you know they're doing it again this weekend. Right. That's yeah. The next comment was going to be oh, they still sorry. need volunteers because they're going to be doing another a second set of masks uh, this weekend to finish up the total of 50,000. And uh, I think you all got the note from the governor saying that it was pretty well covered by the media and uh, got some good uh, media exposure for the project. And uh, again, it will be going on again this weekend. So if anyone is interested, uh, Dan will be happy to uh, receive you and help you do it. Uh, Lori, you want to tell us a little bit about the experience? Yes, I just, and a couple, yes, because I wanted to let you know that one, um, I, I didn't get the follow-up email or somehow I missed it, but just so you know, they did not take temperatures. Um, so don't, if you do go, don't expect them to, because um, they don't have the um, equipment to do it. Unfortunately, I guess they put a, a call out or something and they couldn't get the type of uh, thermometers they needed. Plus, um, I talked to Dan uh, because of some things that happened that day. Um, just so you know that St. Joe's, where they already made a, sh he already was actually delivering to uh, St. Joe, no, St. Jude's. So I'm sorry, it's St. Jude's Foundation. They were the ones that were that were uh, had said that they would donate um, the gloves, and we we wore masks and we're making shields. Um, they will not be having, uh, I, I guess they, can't, they don't have enough uh, masks to, to do that again this weekend. So volunteers will be wearing the shields that we're making. And also um, they won't be providing gloves. They, they, uh, St. Jude's feels that it's a, a false sense of protection and we don't need them. But so if you, but I was, what I was saying is if you are going and you feel the need to wear gloves, then I would suggest you bring them, uh, bring them, bring your hand sanitizer. I mean, that's what I was, I mean, I wore gloves, but um, you know, you have to wash your hands before you go into a bathroom and wash your hands and then you, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to, within the realm of what they had to keep up. So if I were you, I'd bring your own gloves. Um, if you don't want, if you want to wear a mask under the shield, make sure you bring that. If they, I'm assuming they'll let you bring that in. And I would bring hand sanitizer if you have. So um, I enjoyed it. Um, it's, it. You don't get to really talk too much because you're at, you know, you're at your own little table. Um, but I, my rotary moment was I got to um, meet uh, of Jim, of uh, somebody that Jonathan works out with at a gym, his gym that is a member of the um, Newport Beach uh, Rotary, and I knew he was going to be there, but you know I, I won't be able to pick him out of a lineup because you know, oh yeah, Mark's Club, because uh, you know it was between the sh the mask he was wearing and the shields, but we did get to from afar, uh, you know, wave to each other, and. Um, and then there was a mother daughter uh, in front of me working and uh, because they were from the same family, they were able to work on a, a, a task that two people could. And she turned after about sitting there for like an hour, over an hour, she turned around to me and asked me, well, what is Rotary? Which means they were Rotarians, which was great. They were, they saw it on uh, social media and they signed up and came down. So it was, it was nice. Um, like I said, you don't really get to, to mingle, but somebody you know, delivered the mask to me and we, you know, we, even though we had our own covered mask and we, it, you know, we were able to banter a little and, and, and have some fun. And, and was there was the music playing, huh? What was the process? What was the process? Yeah. I don't know. I was on the other side. Oh. My thing, I was putting labels on. Okay. Where <laughs> was the location where you went? When? I went to the Anaheim hotel, which oh. is real close. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you for representing the club there, and, uh, and thank you for your work and taking oh, my pleasure. opportunity to go out there. Yeah. Uh, also, I, 
I think all of you saw, and, and I want to express my thanks to those who contributed to Jill's uh, daughter's GoFundMe page. Uh, they did make their goal, and uh, we'll be in touch and see how things are going with, with Jill and her family. It's certainly a trying time and a difficult time at any time, but now with the virus going around, it makes it even more difficult, uh, especially for her daughter coming home and needing the care that she does in these times. So again, but thank you to all of you who participated and uh, supported her. Uh, the page is still up if you are so inclined. I'm sure uh, she wouldn't mind having some extras. Was she uh, even aware that, uh, that, that, uh, that GoFundMe page was being done? No. I don't know. I didn't talk oh. to her. I, you know, quite honestly, I felt as long as if her daughter put it up, mm -hmm. God bless her daughter and, and we'll help Jill through her daughter's GoFundMe page. I didn't want to, you know, embarrass her or make it any more than it was. But I did want the club to know that that page was there if people were inclined to support it. The, so, the only thing is, is I mean, I, I did donate it to it, but, I, but uh, I didn't know. I mean, I've known Jill for a long time, but I didn't know she had a second daughter. She has three daughters. She has a third yeah. daughter. So I didn't, so it shows you how much I know. She and, called me to, um, to thank Jonathan and I for our donation. Oh. Um, no, she, she didn't know that. Uh, yeah. she, uh, what's her name? Sherry? No, it's not Sherry. Uh, um, no, Sherry. Hey. That, that she had put that up, but she was, uh, yeah, it, it, she was very touched. Yeah. Um, they're doing a lot of work. It's hard. You can't get people in right now to uh, do a lot of the work. Thank goodness Jim, uh, her husband knows how to do all this construction and now Jill can. So, um, but she was uh, in good spirits and, uh, pardon? I don't know, does, does, well, Dixon, I don't know, if, I mean, everybody knows that her daughter, um, they had, had blood clots and uh, had to have her leg amputated and, um, in fact, the children of this daughter are both um, suffering from these uh, blood clots, and they don't know what is going on. So there's there's a lot going on in that family. Mm -hmm. So, but, okay. um, yeah. Is is Richard Rubin on? I don't see him. I don't see him. Okay. So we don't have any any announcements. So okay. Well, moving on then. Are there any other announcements that anyone has that they'd like to make? Well, the district okay, is well, let's the turn over to uh, James and uh, would like to participate. Uh, James and Josephine. Oh, well, Lane, Lane, Lane has an announcement. Lane has some. So I just said that the district is having a meeting, Zoom meeting at 6.30. You can sign up at uh, on rotary5320.org if you want to get an invite. It's at 6.30. And, uh, on Monday. On Monday. Monday the, okay. th the 13th, right at 6.30. Okay, great, thank you. And you can uh, you can buy your own drinks at home for that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, James, Josephine, you're on. All right. I, have, I have the two slides if you want me to share anything. Um, so yeah. I actually, Josephine sent me over the slides also, so I can just do all of it from my screen just to uh, okay. make it a little bit easier. And I'll, I'll pass the, make the host over to you. Okay. Okay. So now, so now you're driving. Okay. Cars. Yeah. And we'll take a time. We'll try to keep it pretty brief and high level just so we can have some time for questions um, after we're all done. So um, let's jump right into it. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, can you guys all see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Looks like an iPad on my computer. Okay. Huh? Okay. So um, this is uh, an article that Edward Jones puts out on a weekly basis. It's our weekly market update. So I post this on my LinkedIn uh, every Monday morning. Um, so if you guys want updates going forward to all of the kind of craziness that we have going on, um, you can send me a connection on LinkedIn and you'll have access to all of the posts. Um, so well, for starters, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the unemployment situation that we have going on right now. So previously, 
the record unemployment mm -hmm. claims in a week uh, was 700,000. So three weeks ago, we had unemployment claims that were 3.3 million. Uh, so that was a pretty unprecedented amount at that time. And then we followed that up last week with 6.9 million claims. And then this week, uh, this morning, um, we just got the report that showed an additional 6.6 .6 million claims. So um, as you can imagine, that's a, a pretty unprecedented amount of claims, about 10% of the existing workforce. Um, but the interesting thing um, from an unemployment perspective with regard to this crisis is that took us three weeks to hit those astronomical numbers, whereas in the Great Recession of 2008, it took us 28 weeks um, to hit 10 million unemployment claims. So just the caliber and the speed at which these things are affecting the market is pretty staggering uh, and pretty different from anything that we've seen before. Um, but one of the interesting things about that is economists and pretty much everybody thought that when we saw those staggering unemployment numbers, we would see a pretty substantial dip in the market. However, the last three weeks after those uh, high jobless claims went through, we saw an uptick in the market. So it's pretty counterintuitive to what you would expect. And what that tells us is that the pessimism associated with the economy is largely already built into the pricing of the market. So what we're seeing is the, the large fluctuations on a daily basis are more tied to the headline risk and everything involved with the virus itself. So um, with that being said, we'll probably be seeing quite, volatility is going to be the norm for the next foreseeable months um, while we kind of deal with stabilizing, lowering the curve and seeing how social distancing is going to affect um, you know, where we peak from a, a virus case perspective. Um, so if we shift over to looking at, you know, what is a recession? Are we in one now? So technically a recession is when the market contracts the GDP for two consecutive quarters. So we contracted last quarter and we're just at the start of this quarter. But as you can imagine with the dip that we've seen over the last just three weeks and end of March, beginning of April, um, all of the economists and everybody industry wide is expecting that we're going to be technically in a recession by the end of this quarter. Um, the other question that we get a lot is how long is a recession going to last? Um, and, you know, the interesting thing is the recessions, I mean, Josephine's going to touch on this a little bit, but recessions, um, are oftentimes, or are, are, are typically from history perspective, much shorter than, than the upticks in the market. So a little bit of good news, however, in this situation is that you can see on this, um, this table here that um, the average household uh, in this situation, uh, household savings rate is 8.2%, which is um, about double the amount that it was in the last two market crashes that we had in 2008 and 2001. So what that tells us is that most households are going to be in a better position to weather the storm over the next few months uh, than they were in, in prior situations. Um, and then I saw an article this morning that was talking about um, seeing the unemployment claims come out and then the big uptick in uh, and then the marginal uptick in the market pricing um, that said, don't worry about the unemployment uh, claims. Um, you know, everything's going to be fine, which is kind of an irresponsible uh, message in my opinion, because we're not done with unemployment claims. Those numbers that we've seen thus far is um, just people that were able to get on and access the system. Um, from the reports that we're receiving, there's a lot of people that were, the system was kind of overwhelmed and they weren't even able to get on and process their claims. So we're not done from an unemployment claim perspective. So we're going to see that continue through the month of April. And economists are expecting us to peak between a 12 and 20% unemployment rate. Um, which we can't downplay as it's going to have a significant effect on the market over the rest of quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, into the beginning of next year. So um, something we definitely need to keep an eye on as well. Um, it also speaks a little bit to the CARE Act, but I know that Jim went over that last week, so I'll skip that portion. Um, and then I'll kind of wrap up my section with um, people ask how the market's going to perform during a recession. So the average market um, loss during recessions that we've seen in, in uh, in history has been 34% from peak to trough. Um, 
but what we see is the year after the recession, you typically on average see a 25% recovery. And then years two, three, and four, you typically see an average of a 32% annually recovery from there. So although we're kind of putting our mouthpiece in right now and things were really tough for everybody, um, there is going to be an upside to it. And um, typically the returns on, on those recoveries are exponential, even in just the short period of the first couple of years after the downturn. So um, for a little bit of perspective historically on how things are done, I know Josephine's going to touch on that piece. So I will uh, pass it over to Josephine. Thank you, James. And thanks everyone for joining the call today. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay, good. Good here. All right, so this is an emotional time. It's very emotional for everybody. And I think a lot of the questions I get um, is, is this the worst? Have we seen it like this before? And this slide, I wanted to show it because I share it with all my clients. And I really have them focus in on what this means. And let me caveat this by saying anything I present past performance is no guarantee of future results, okay? And this document here from First Trust is really showing us from when the index started back in 1926, how has it fared until today? And you can clearly see that blue outweighs the orange or gold that you see. And blue is what we want to focus on. So even when times get emotional, you know, I tell my clients and I want you guys to think about your personal situation and realize that when we're looking at long term, it's not the money that you need now. It's what you're going to use way down the line or even legacy out to people or organizations that you care about. And even though we're seeing emotions, dips, any decreases, they're common. They're part of the system that we have. So even if everyone thinks that it's dire and people are looking at their statements finally and saying, what is all this red? You really have to be calm and understand that this is just a normal part of the market cycle. Now, I'm not saying coronavirus and all these emotions are normal, um, but we've had pandemics before and we've had even worse in our history before, wars, um, just issues. And the common theme is markets continue to go up after a period of time. Okay, and then the next one I wanna show you, and I set all my clients up to understand that this chart's gonna show us. There's a lot of like dots and gray bars and I really want you to focus in on the dots because the dots are in any calendar year, right? In any year, this is how much the market has dropped every year, right? For the past, what, since the 80s? But the bars, the gray bars are showing us what did that calendar year 12 month period average out in terms of returns for the S&P 500? Because it's expected that in every year, the S&P will go down between, what, three to four times a year. And these are the lowest amounts. The red dots represent the lowest amounts that's gone down in that one year. But overall, if you look at the average for that 12-month period, for the most part, it's gone up. But it's not uncommon to expect a downturn. So I want to instill confidence in everybody listening that this too shall pass and we just have to continue with a long-term strategy. You just have to believe that hopefully everyone's working with an advisor or talking to someone to understand that this is emotional, but it's long-term strategy. Let's just stick with it, right? So that's what I wanted to share. And Really, I think the takeaway is what can we do now? You know, and what am I telling my clients? I'm telling them one, because I've already diversified their portfolio. You haven't lost anything until you sell. Just like with any home, right? If you have a home and your neighbors are all selling because the market's hot, then yeah, you're going to make money if you sell when the market's hot, when it's high. If you sell when we're in a recession and all the prices are down, you know, 
really you're selling when it's at the bottom. That's not what we want because then you're going to actualize those losses. So since a lot of the people I work with, we are looking long term. Um, I tell them if you sell now, we're locking in losses and that's really not what we want to do. Yeah, and to Josephine's point, um, this is a very emotional time for everybody. We, we say like the market, it's the normal market cycle, the market's gonna recover and everything's gonna be fine in the long term, but it, we can't downplay the fact that this is, I mean, like Josephine said, this is a very scary time and a very emotional time for everybody. Um, so one of the things that we do with our clients is try to make sure that in this time from an investing perspective, uh, we're removing as much emotion out of our investing decisions as we possibly can. Because in this time of crazy volatility where the market's going up 7%, down 13%, up 4%, um, it's very easy to get caught up in the emotions of the situation and start trying to time the market and time the swings. Um, but that's where investors can get into a lot of trouble. So what we try to do is just put a systematic approach together for investing during times of extreme volatility um, to make sure that you're kind of averaging out your benefit because everything right now is, is cheap because we're so far down in the market. If the, you know, X amount of money that you put in this week does a little bit less um, amazing than the X amount that you put in next week, that's fine. When the market recovers, you know, at the you know, end of this year, beginning of next year, um, hopefully, um, you're going to see an amazing return on those funds, exponential returns as it is. So just being able to take a step back, remove some of that emotion and create a systematic investing approach is, you know, is the best way to help avoid making mistakes during this kind of a volatile time in the market. So that was pretty That's much right. all that we had. Um, if you guys have any questions, let us know. Yeah, we really wanted to open it up to questions if people are kind of experiencing some anxiety over it and just be available to help remedy that. I have a, 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 just a uh, kind of a general question in that in these uh, downturns in the market, do you, do you think there's a lot of uh, major corporations doing taking this opportunity to do stock buybacks? I think they're always looking at that, but from my understanding, and at least the companies that I closely follow, right? Because I can't spend my day being an analyst all day long. That's not my job. But the companies I truly believe in and follow, their balance sheets are so liquid. They've got so much money that I, I think they're just trying to weather this storm out. And those are the companies that I encourage my clients to buy into because their stock price is at such a deep discount. You know, you're talking about 50% off from what we're seeing two, three years ago, and they're just strong financially still. Now, if they're gonna look and say, let me use that capital to buy our stock back, you know, that's them. I think right now, a lot of them, and some of my um, C CFO counterparts I've worked with at these big firms in the past have told me they're trying to keep that cash because they don't know what it's gonna look like nine to 12 months out in terms of cash flow. They wanna protect their balance sheet. So I think we may not see a lot of the buybacks right now, but maybe towards third or fourth quarter, we'll start to see how some of these executives are really gonna assess you know, their market strategy for their companies. Yeah, I was just thinking in terms of the, the government <laughs> that's providing su support to some of these major industries that uh, the, the president has said none of the money that the, that the feds are sending out can be used for stock buybacks. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be true, but certainly it can be used to fill the hole that the company makes for itself by stock buyback out of its uh, current capital. True. Yeah, but to, just, to Josephine's point, I think that was pretty spot on from uh, companies trying to weather the storm and, and stay as liquid as possible in this time. Um, I think that's a, a big key for a lot of companies, especially from us from an investment perspective, is we're looking at companies from a balance sheet standpoint that have enough liquidity to be able to withstand the storm because a lot of the CEOs and CFOs are taking a little bit more of a, a bearish approach to the view of it because we just want to make sure we don't underestimate the effect of this extreme downturn and this you know, unprecedented high unemployment rate, all of those things are going to take on the market. 
And initially when everything started, the economists were expecting kind of more of a V-shaped recovery and things like that. But as it plays out um, and we're getting a little bit more into the weeds on the virus situation, it's shifting more to a U-shaped recovery, meaning they're expecting a little bit of a longer, a little bit, you know, a little bit more of a tough recovery um, than we initially thought. Because on a lot of the calls and analyst calls that we had right when the virus was beginning, they were talk the messaging was 2020 is the year of the virus and 2021 will be the year of the recovery. Well, they've kind of backpedaled a little bit on that messaging uh, in the last few calls that we've had and saying, you know, 2021 is going to be the, the year of the start of the recovery and then 2022 is going to, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So people have kind of taken a little more of a step back and, and had some scope on the situation of the severity of how it's going to affect the market for the long term. Um, and, and so it's going to be a little bit more of a slow recovery. So the, the liquidity for a lot of these companies is going to be key. Well, one of the things from a personal standpoint, we were in the take out, taking out mode and not the putting in mode. Uh, but it, on advice of our uh, portfolio manager, we've stopped the, stopped the takeout, which the, the current legislation allows us to do now without penalty so that uh, we can stretch it out a little bit longer. So that's, that's something that people should consider too. If you're in a position where you have to take out of your IRAs, you can now stop taking out if you can and uh, yeah. preserve that capital in your IRA. That's right, yeah. Dick. And for those people that, you know, kind of wait until April to take their RMDs, they've been lucky because since this news came out in March and they didn't have to take it for 2019, it's really helped them even from a tax perspective. Okay, are there any other questions? So with the, uh, the comment about uh, thinking that it may be 2021 before we see a kind of a full recovery of the market. Uh, now, since the, year, the data that you shared is uh, March 31st, we've seen a, I think almost 20% pop in the market since, since the end of the month. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, do, you, do they expect that to continue for a while or do they expect it's going to end up dipping again? Or I mean, that's all speculation, I realize. But. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It, go ahead, sir. Yeah, so what I can say to that, because if anyone tells you, hey, yeah, this is going to stop and we'll get back to normal like in July, I, I would throw up red flags. I think the only thing we can guarantee is volatility. So it can be up this week and it can be down next week. You, I think you have to prepare for it. And it's that preparation. It's making sure that you've set yourself up for the long term that will weather the storm. Yeah, and kind of like we were saying from a um, like a headline risk perspective. So the, the last jump in a couple of days is we've seen, you know, a lot of different news agencies saying that we're we're getting a little bit of a lowering of the curve, and certain agencies are lowering their expectation of fatalities associated with the virus. There's been a lot of a lot of positive press this week around the virus, um, so that's why we're thinking that we're seeing such a, a positive, optimistic spike this week. Um, but to Josephine's point from, uh, making sure that we're just not reacting like, you know, like everybody in the public does and making sure that we're being conservative on our estimates of how it's going to affect the market, um, mm -hmm. is that could easily change tomorrow if all of a sudden another large city becomes a, a hot spot and then we have a, another serious issue next week. So, um, it unfortunately right now is very high fluctuation based on news of the virus and it's a volatile situation in and of itself that we need to be very careful about jumping on the fact that we saw a three-day straight upswing in the market um, because that could just as easily be down tomorrow. So we just want to make sure that we're, we're you know, having a wide perspective on it, realizing that the market is fluctuating drastically based on new news of the virus um, and just kind of stay on top of it from that perspective. But again, the systematic approach to the investing kind of takes that emotional piece out of it. Whether we bought in last week when it was really low, buy in this week a little bit when it's a little bit higher, and buy in next week when it's back down a little bit, if it goes back down. Um, that's, that's you know, the, the R and the, and the Edward Jones opinion is the best way to, to mitigate a lot of that um, right. headline risk and fluctuation. And if I can just add just a couple of comments to that, you know, as we look at our portfolios, even as individuals or families or nonprofits, most people don't have all their eggs in stocks. And if they do, I mean, please call me so I can help you walk off that ledge. Um, a lot of people are in mutual funds, right, or active managed funds or ETFs. And what makes up those funds are the way portfolio managers select their buying or selling. It's my job to know 
what these mutual fund companies, what these portfolio managers are doing in times of these volatilities, because that's where you're going to see an impact in your own portfolio, other than how your stocks are performing and are you getting dividend income? You know, so even if we're seeing gains right now, I want to make sure, hey, are the portfolio managers holding on or are they selling and what is their sell strategy when they're selling off from the fund? Because that's what's more important to the, during these volatile times. And that's where that conversation you have with your own advisor comes into play to help you get that confidence and that comfort in your diverse portfolio. Okay. Well, thank you both very much. We really appreciate your, your look at the market for us and how things look for now and for the, the future and the distant future. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, we can all keep our fingers crossed and hope that we'll turn the corner successfully. Uh, in, the, in future meetings, uh, we have Roger is going to talk to us next week about the tax implications of what's going on uh, with the government stimulus package and how it's going to affect us uh, in the near term and potentially the long term. And then uh, the following week, if he can get himself unburied from all of the uh, submittals that are coming in, Richard Rubin is going to talk to us about banking and what's going on in the banking industry with this uh, stimulus package and how it's impacting people individually and also uh, small businesses which are scrambling to try to take advantage of it, but are running into the, the roadblock of a very small organization, i.e. the Small Business Administration, and that's become a real clog for the submission of all of these small business applications. And businesses are, as are having trouble getting through the government uh, to take advantage of government programs. It's there, but it's not getting out right now, and they're looking for a better way to do it. And uh, Richard right now is in training uh, for his bank on how they can manage that. And then uh, also he'll be talking about what banks are looking to do to help the individual beyond just the government stimulus packages. Uh, as he mentioned last week, uh, their bank is uh, restructuring or working on helping people with their mortgages. Uh, more, expect more banks to uh, lock on to that and uh, try to help in that as well. But anyway, that's what's coming up in the next two weeks. Roger next week, Richard the following week. And uh, I want all of you to make sure you stay safe, stay healthy, wash your hands, and uh, take after Fred's suggestion, make a call. Make a call to a friend, to a Rotarian, to, to a family member. Make sure all is well and you all stay well. So with that, I'm going to. I have one thing to oh, say. Oh, Helen has a comment. I want to thank you, uh, Lori and Jonathan, for the, the nice email of the, the heart that you sent out to everybody. That was very touching. Okay, with that good news, I'm going to end the meeting, and uh, y'all are free to chat now if you'd like to chat. <laughs> happy Easter, everybody. Yeah, yeah happy right. Easter. Yeah, happy too. Easter. Bye-bye, guys. Okay, bye-bye now. Yeah, James, you're driving. You're the one that hangs it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.